time, we're gonna get going. Um, my name is Corey Schrader. I'm uh, currently the, the chair of the new evangelization team. Um, so we want to thank you all for your, your uh, decision to come out and join us tonight. We're very excited. It was great to see everybody uh, getting to talk to one another uh, in, uh, in, over the last few minutes. Um, that's part of this. We want to make sure everybody comes and, and makes new connections in the, in the parish. So if you talk to folks that you know, uh, the, the last half hour, we hope as the program goes on tonight, uh, there'll be some time for discussion. We hope you will talk to some folks and meet some folks that you maybe don't know as well. Uh, that's certainly part of what we want to accomplish with, uh, with this event. So um, we're very excited to have uh, Father Tochi uh, lead the discussion tonight. Uh, as, I, as you may have heard when we, we discuss at Mass um, and, and in the invitation, yeah, the goal of this is to, to have a, a discussion about uh, the, the, the concept of evangelization in the kind of the modern context. Uh, and the world we live in is a very different world. We're not trying to uh, you know, introduce Jesus to people who have never heard of him before. Uh, we're really trying to uh, now you know, reach out to people who have heard of him and have maybe rejected him, or maybe people who have been member of the church and have maybe pulled away from the church. How do we reach those people, uh, and how do we uh, evangelize to them? It's a, it's a complex and, and challenging topic, but one that's obviously worthy of our uh, time and attention, and uh, so we're excited to have Father Tochi lead us through that discussion uh, tonight. I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Father Tochi. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Today we are going to just have a discussion on new evangelization. And today what we hope to achieve is to understand what is it all about and why. That's the aim and the point of today. Because when we talk about new evangelization, people ask, what does that mean? So we'll begin. I guess a prayer that you picked. We want us to begin with that prayer. That's the prayer of new evangelization, as I found it on the website of the Bishop's Con Catholic Bishop's Conference. So we'll begin in the name of the Father, Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll, we'll pray together. Heavenly Father, Father Lord, 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 So today we gather to talk about new evangelization in perspective. What does that mean? What are we talking about when we talk about new evangelization? I remember when I was with the Claritians. Claritians are a missionary group all over the world. And one of, one, one of the assignments I was sent to a place that we are very different from my culture, and very different from the way I think and the way I understood things. And then I got there, the question was for me, what do I do? How do I bring the good news of Jesus to these people? How do I do that to the people? So new evangelization is in that context. What do you do in a world or society that is different? Or in a society that seems not to be what you think a society ought to be. So that is what new evangelization brings us or pulls us together. And 
The question we'll be asking how Jesus proclaimed the gospel in today's world. Christ encountered people in their lives. And encountering them, he encountered their hopes and dreams, their sickness, their sin, their joy, their sorrow. But he loved them. He loved them. That's the key. And challenged them and then proclaimed the good news to them. That is all we talk about when we talk about the good news of Jesus as a path to salvation. The new evangelization invites us to put on the mind of Christ to encounter people in today's world, recognizing that today's world is very different. That is very different from the world even a decade ago, a generation ago, that the world today is very different. So to love them and to challenge them. And Paul gives us a key. When you read the Acts of Apostles, chapter 7, 17, verse 22, following, you will read the story of Paul when he went to Athens. The story of Paul when he went to Athens, and then he preached about the resurrection to the people. And they told him, we'll hear you on this next time. If you pay attention to that dialogue and encounter, when Paul went back, he didn't come back to change anything. He didn't come back to tell them how horrible they were, but rather he found something in their culture and then bring the good, brought the good news to come and live and connect in that culture. He lived among them and challenge them to see the good news of Jesus in a new way, with new tools, with new insights. That's what new evangelization does. So new evangelization changes nothing and does not compromise. It doesn't change to the values of the society. It doesn't compromise or lose itself. The new evangelization shines a light on what is already here in our faith. It aims not just to draw people in, but to reinvigorate those who have been here all along. What you do with people who have been evangelized, but are still are fallen apart because they don't understand, because one crisis of the faith, or the other. What do we do? New evangelization aims to reinvigorate, to bring new energy, to bring new values, to bring new insights to that group of people. And we have John Paul II, St. John Paul II, as one of the key people that brought this reality in our world. John Paul II says, I sense that the moment has come to commit all the church's energies to a new evangelization and to the mission at Gentiles, to the mission of all people, to the mission at Gentiles. No believer in Christ, no institution of the church can avoid this supreme duty to proclaim Christ to all peoples. So new evangelization comes to proclaim Christ to all people, but first of all, helping us to acquire the mind of Christ. The question becomes, what is this new evangelization and why? Why do we need it? Why do we even talk about new evangelization when we are seeing missionaries everywhere, every but but is claiming to be a missionary and we contribute to give and we support missions so why talk about new evangelization today new evangelization invites the church to think of new ways to bring the good news of Jesus to a changing world to a world that is fallen apart to a world that is abandoning the Christian civilization in which is the, the, the society is formed. The world that is moving away from freedom to with responsibility, 
to absolute freedom. And we'll see what are the consequences of those attitudes. So the good new evangelization is asking us what new insights, how do we respond, how do we speak the language of Jesus to a people who do not even see the need for God again in their lives. In baptism, each person is given the task of proclaiming the gospel. So the mission is for all. You see John Paul II talk about the mission is for everyone. All of us are called to this new evangelization. It's not meant for some. It's for everyone to come. So new evangelization has a sure belief that in Christ there are inexhaustible riches as we read in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8 that this that in Christ Jesus there are inexhaustible riches which no culture or era can fully explore so which means each period each era we find ourselves we pay attention to what is happening and then understand how to respond to the needs of the people for the good news of Jesus. For the good news of Jesus. And we have, I have the survey to help us think about this. And the years are there. They are those who identify themselves as nuns or have no religious affiliation. You know, you hear people talk about, I'm a good person, but I'm, so I don't need the church. I'm a good person, I don't need God. You ask yourself, how even is that possible <coughs> that you can live your life independent of the source of life? You know, sometimes you will think about it. I think about it this way. If, was, if someone comes up and say, I don't need God, it means that he is the creator of himself, right? Mm -hmm. And then if he's the creator of himself, it means that he should have made himself perfect, <laughs> lacking nothing. <laughs> so you see, when people proclaim God's ascribed to certain things, they don't truly understand. That's why the church is asking us to pay attention, to become that witness that will help them understand that they are just making an illogical argument, an argument that has no basics, that someone will come up and say, I'm a good person. If they are a good person, so who? makes the parent, it means there are some things that are bad, right? If there are things that are bad, it means someone created a judge, the parameter of judging something good and evil. So if you say you're a good person, it means indirectly you're saying there is someone out there or something out there who decides what is good and evil and that you have decided to do what is good and evil yet. You think there is no need for religious affiliation. You think there is no need for, you think you can be nuns. And then there is another group that is so disturbing. Those called the, the, the religious, they, they attend the church a few times a year. You know, and you ask yourself why? What has gone wrong? What did they see? What did they not see? And for us who still find the need for God, we have this duty and this invitation today to see that we respond to the invitation to join Jesus in ministering to the people. Because the Christian societies, which we are evangelized many, many centuries ago, today are almost gone. The values that we hold so dear to our hearts 
and vanishing before us. So we need to wake up and do something. Increasingly, the Christian mission, which is the responsibility of all people of God, is being left to a group of specialists. The priests, the theologians. Then we wonder what has happened to our baptism and our baptismal promise when we are, we are baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ. And by that point, we become priests, kings, and prophets. Then what has happened to it? What went wrong? Why? What can we do? New evangelization becomes the key that we need to respond to this call by the church. So I want us to break into small groups and have a discussion. What changed? What is there something that God clarified in your understanding of new evangelization? Where you're thinking it's something new, we have to change what the church teaches, we have to change the way we celebrate Mass, we have to... What changed? Do we still believe after hearing that it's new insights but not compromise? Do we still believe that the church is the conscience of the society. So what changed, what clarified? So we we'll take like 10 minutes, 10 minutes and in small groups. And now we look at the church, the church identity objection, the objectives. What is actually the church? You know, it's so easy to get stuck by looking at the church as an institution and we see all the failures of those in charge, we see all the failures, the mistakes, and then we we'll just dismiss the fact that we are the church. You know, just think about a family. Family. All of us come from family and there is one particular thing we can remember about our family. Just imagine for a moment, one member of that family walks away or uh, forget the value or abuse the value. Does that one person, does it mean that the family itself has become a failure? If the answer is no, then why not look at the church that way? Why not look at the church that way? Because all we talk about in new evangelization points to the church, brings us back to the church, church as an institution, and us as the church itself. Because we begin to ask, why is new evangelization leading to what or to who? It's leading to Jesus. Because it's leading to Jesus who draws you in to encounter him so that you can be transformed that you can no longer hold it just for yourself. That you get transformed to the point where you go out there to minister. You go out there to tell Jesus what it looks to, to tell people what it looks like to know God mm -hmm. through Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we ask, and we, you know, people will say, why not practice, why practice religion? when you can just be spiritual. And they have their definition of spiritual and what that looks like. You know, they said, oh, I can be in my house and worship God. And then you, you, we get confused. We forget that Jesus, yeah, it may not be implicitly that he founded a church, but he did. He founded a church. We know that. And he founded it for a specific purpose and with a specific mission. Because the church is the means by which the Father, Father's plan of salvation continues to, to happen. And we look at the church mm -hmm. as the place we are drawn into and sent out. It's not just to draw us in and we remain there. 
we are drawn into it. And then we are sent out to a world that is seeking Jesus, to a world that is seeking answers to the questions of life. So the church was instituted by Christ as the means by which we, God continues to make himself present to the world. And we are all called to be instruments of that God's presence among the world and in the world. And we look at the, the formats of the church. I will talk about this in context. I'm not going to talk about it in its technical terms, but in the context in which we are speaking about new evangelization in the perspective of Christian mission today. The Catholic the Church as one. We are Catholic as one holy Catholic and apostolic. What does that mean to us today? We we'll start from the apostolic. We have one leader, the supreme leader, the Pope. But we, he represents us. And we go like the apostles we are being sent. We are sent to go just like the apostles. And we go with the Spirit of God, who is the reason for the mission. And holy. You know, we think about holiness as perfection. Holiness is cooperating with the grace of God, realizing our limits and our dependence and the need to stay connected to Jesus, who is the reason for the mission. That is holiness. Because we think of perfection as holiness, and then we think ourselves not qualified, not worthy. We can't do it. We, we are not good enough. The grace of God is made available, sufficient and enough. Holiness is realizing that we are only human with certain limits. And the mission we are, we are encouraged and invited to is the mission of Jesus. So we stay connected to the person who invites us so that he can supply. He can supply the strength. And he can give us the insights to realize and discover ways in which the people in this changing world can be met. They can be reached. That is holiness. And Catholic. What does that mean, Catholic? Universal means all are invited. But all are not asked to remain the way they come. That is the key. All are welcome, yes. But when you come, allow yourself to be transformed. Allow yourself to conform to the will of the one who has invited you. It's universal. It's for everyone. We don't put barriers. We don't become obstacles. But you do not come and tell the church how to bring the presence of God into the, in the world. We come. No one is stopping. But come. It's just like Peter. When Peter encountered Jesus, he said, go away. I am a sinful man. He realized the beauty of God. But he did not walk away. He walked with Jesus. And Jesus made him Peter the Rock. That today we have the successors of Peter in the popes. So that's the beauty of the church and the God that we are all invited to become part of. We talk about maintenance and mission, therefore. So I'm going to talk about the models of the church to understand that new evangelization is moving us away from maintenance. It's no longer just maintaining that pew. You come to mass, you go to the last seat and sit down and maintain that position. No, it's you come and see how beautiful God is. And then that you want to go out there and encounter someone in, on the street, someone in the commons, someone by your side in the pews. So we look at the church as a family. But before then, 
The Catechism of the Catholic Church gives us wonderful clue to all this we've been talking about. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 763, 763, it says, It was the Son's task to accomplish the Father's plan of salvation in the fullness of time. Its accomplishment was the reason for his being sent. The Lord Jesus inaugurated his church by preaching the good news. The good news. That is, the coming of the reign of God, promised over the ages in the scriptures. To fulfill the Father's will, Christ ushered in the kingdom of heaven on earth. The church is the reign of Christ already present in mystery that we become the expression of the reign of God. That when we see someone there at the back of the pews with no one to speak to, we become the smiling face of Jesus. Because that is what is needed at that point. That we become the smiling face of Jesus to that person who is standing alone by himself or herself. That is what Jesus came to establish and inviting us to bring that mystery into reality by the way we witness to that good news of Jesus. The church is the light of humanity. The Lumen Gentium tells us that. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church number 748 also talks about that. And the, the church is assembly of God's people. As the light of the community, the church has no other light than Christ. So you are becoming a light not in your own terms, not in my own terms, not how I feel, not how I think, but according to the law, the will of God, whom we are joining. So like the sun, all its light is reflected from the, like the moon, all its light is reflected from the sun. As the assembly of God's people, we are all that, all that belongs to the Lord. We draw our life from the word and body of Christ, from the body, from the word of God and the sacraments that we gather to celebrate. And so the church herself, the assembly, becomes Christ's body. Think about the analogy of Paul, that we are all parts of the body. You cannot become indifferent if we must be part of this new evangelization. We can be thinking, oh, it's not my problem. It's their problem. It's not my issue. It's their problem. It's not happening in our church. It's not happening in my family. We are all called because by our participation in the mystery of God, we become the body of Christ, that we work together in the mind and the heart of the head, who is Christ himself. So the church has family. Think of family as a place that all work together to uphold the family values and legacy. Think of it when someone from your family walks away from that, that bond of love. Just think about how do you feel. So how, why are you okay that people are identifying as nuns? People identifying as non-religious affiliated. Why are we okay? If we understand that the church is a family of God's people, why are we okay? Why are we not sharing the value system of this family of God? Why are we afraid? What the society will think or say? They will laugh at me. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I'm not qualified. Oh, I'm not a priest. I'm not a deacon. Oh, I didn't go to a theological school. So I can't even do it. We are family. Our job <coughs> is to uphold the principles or the values of God, whom we call our Father. What do you mean when you say our Father? It means we belong to the same family of God's people. And the, thing, the second one, the church as community of faith. The community of faith 
fellowshipping with one another and shared salvation through Jesus. And Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 talk about carrying each other's burden. When we talk about the church as community of faith, what comes to your mind? It means we have one faith in which all are gathered to submit to, and that is the faith in Jesus. It means we gathered as one in Jesus to speak one language, the language of good news of Jesus, the language of God's presence among his people. And that means also that among this community, some people are, are falling down, that we need to hold them up. It means that our job is to hold each other up so that this community will be like the community spoken about in the house of apostles. When, even in Antioch, when they call them, look at how they love themselves. They must be followers of the way. And that's how we got our name, Christians, Christ-like. Christ-like. See how they love themselves. See how they share things among themselves. See how they carry each other's burden. See how I get a call because I wasn't in church for two weeks. See how someone sees me next weekend and asks, I didn't see you in church, it's all, is everything okay? That is the community that we hope to bring. Because we're thinking about, have we thought about it that those who are identifying as nuns, maybe they have come to church, they are not discovering anything different. The society lied to them. The society is failing them, and they come back to the church, and they see nothing different. We become like a social club, where we come, feel good, and then we go home. And then we don't even bother to ask, what is going on with your life? New evangelization is getting new insight that we are the church. In different, respect, in, 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 in different perspectives. And until we realize that and wake up to that, we'll keep complaining. We'll keep talking about it. But the new evangelization is a way to tell us that we can do it. The only skill that is required is to just want to do it. Allow Jesus to draw you in. So that when you, he draws us in, we get transformed so that we can go out there to become witness of his presence in the world. And we'll talk about the church as an assembly of God's people. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 19 talks about the Lord knows those who are his and everyone must turn away from iniquity. And Romans chapter 5 verse 8 talks about we are all sinners and we are all called to turn away from sin. The same language. No one is better than another. All of us are struggling. You know the difference between community and assembly. Community, there are policies that allows people entrance to it. So the church as community of faith, our baptism brings us into the same faith in Jesus. But assembly of God's people, it means all, you don't decide who gathered in an assembly. But when they come, they are expected to conform to the principle of the assembly. When we speak of the church as an assembly of God's people, we're talking about it's a home hospital for sinners and an opportunity for the saints to witness. That all gather into, into this assembly as people created in the image and likeness of God. But we allow ourselves to be drawn into conformity 
to the principle guiding the church. That we do not come insisting that the church conform to our own principle and value, but rather gradually the sense accompanying the sinners to understand the beauty of conforming to the principle of this assembly that is so beautiful. That is the church as the assembly of God's people. So what does that mean to us today? What does that mean for us today? What are the insights? It means that there is need for all of us to move away, to find ways, new ways, new insights, to bring this presence of God among our people. That we have to move away from maintenance and ask, begin to ask ourselves, how would Jesus love? How would Jesus love? That's the question we need to be asking ourselves every day. How will Jesus love? Will Jesus love by being afraid to say the truth because we do not want to sound different? Is that love? Is that the way Jesus will love? Will Jesus love by confusing judgment and assessment? Will Jesus love that way? Will Jesus love by confusing tolerance and compromise? Will Jesus love that way? Will Jesus love by waiting to do that big project? Or paying attention to someone every Sunday after Mass, he runs away every Sunday. He doesn't even stop to talk to anyone. Will Jesus not want to stop that person and say, my brother, I keep seeing you. You just, what's your name? What is going on? How would Jesus love? I think Jesus will love by being present. I think Jesus will love by not being afraid to encounter people created in the image and likeness of him like us. I think Jesus will love by just not being afraid to encounter people and accompany them to see the good news of Jesus. I think Jesus will love by bringing hope, by holding people up. I think that's how Jesus will love. A new evangelization is that calling for all of us not to think it's meant for special people. That all of us are called to become new evangelizers. It means new insights to what has already been. New methods to what is already there. New perspective to what is already in in presence. It means finding ways to speak the language of the society in which we find ourselves without losing ourselves or watering the good news of Jesus just to feel belong or to make them see us as one of them. Remember, we are in the world but not of the world. The good news of the new evangelization is that it equips us and gives us new tools. New tools to go out there and not be afraid. To understand that we come transformed and try to conform to Jesus in order to go out there to become a witness of God's presence among his people. So we have two more questions to discuss. And you can switch your groups this time. Miss up if you stay with a particular group, you can just move around. And we'll take probably five minutes to talk about this. And then we come back and give 
five, ten minutes opportunity for questions or comments and see how that goes. So for next um, uh, month, we're just going to do to talk about we've heard what and why. We're just going to talk about how, you know, to understand the simplicity of this new evangelization. Because sometimes we hear terms and we think it's so big or so mighty that we cannot. Um, so we talk about a few of the practical ways in which we can be involved, in which we can all be drawn into, so that we can, in wherever we go, we can bring the presence of God for people and for and among people. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we are called by your name. We gather in your name. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit among us. Inspire us, give us courage to always go and be a fruit, fruit that will last. Accompany us as we go home, be with our families, be with our church, be with our parish, that your name alone may be glorified in our lives. We may this prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.